Matt, you were in Hanover. Tell me about your holiday. Well, it was snowing, so it's it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Don is hear me sing. Um, no, it was good. It's nice to be uh, going away. It does mean I'm really behind on all the work I've got to do, but so is everybody, so it's fine. <laughs> I mean, the the most exciting thing I did was I went to the dentist today, and there there is no better compliment than having the dentist say to you, you've good teeth. Specifically, if you're like going to get a filling or something like that, and the dentist was like, yeah, there's some, you need to get a filling, because I cracked my tooth chewing chewing gum in Madrid at that conference in May, and have been putting it off for so long, so went in, got it looked at, and she actually said, you have very nice teeth, and I was like, mm, for someone who like smokes like you know, 10 to 15 cigarettes a day. That's uh, that's shocking. It's what gives me this lovely tone, this lovely podcast tone. But uh, you, you end up feeling really smug, don't you? Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm cool. So if you have enjoyed teeth talk and holiday talk, you're very welcome to Beneath the Skin, <laughs> the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. I am Thomas Omani. I am one of your hosts and I am joined by my esteemed co-host, Dr. Matt Lauder. Hello, how are we doing? Um, hope everyone's having fun. Um, I'm excited for today, actually. Yes, so today we have an incredible guest and a very good topic and a very contentious topic as well. Um, we are joined by Mr. Peter Oakmond Madsen, the famed Northern Black tattooer who specializes in Peter. How would you describe it? Um, roughly speaking, I specialize in historical nonsense. Um, but uh, I think on a general basis, people believe that I specialize in Viking tattoos. And it is that exact topic which we're going to be talking a lot about. Uh, we've mentioned it briefly on the show before, but uh, as we have said, Vikings didn't really have tattoos. Matt, do you want to talk to us about the actual evidence for and against Vikings having tattoos? Well, I mean, the actual evidence is basically there isn't any. Um, <laughs> I mean, so there's this interesting, um, you know, very long historical narrative which talks about, uh, you know, people from elsewhere, from in an English sense, uh, people from not from not from the British Isles having tattoos or or some tattooing being part of the ancient British tradition, and. Yeah, Norsemen or, or or Vikings were occasionally included in those stories. Oh, it's okay, Peter. I've just uh, I've I've just uh, muted your microphone while you're not talking, so it stops the echo. I'll unmute you when you talk. Yeah, there's there were these long sort of standing stories that tattooing, you know, is something which distinguishes particularly kind of you know foreign invading hordes, uh, whether where, wherever you are, and of course, there's none more foreign and none more invading. <laughs> In a British sense, than uh, the Vikings coming over from um, Denmark and Norway and Sweden, but uh, yeah, really not any evidence at all uh, that those cultures practice tattooing. It's funny because you know in the historical imaginary, so in films about Vikings and in video games about Vikings, we we sort of feel that they have to have tattoos, you know, to make them make sense as kind of old and warlike and barbarian and in quotes. Um, but I was looking through, for example, Aaron's book, who was on the other day uh, on our previous That's episode. Aaron Aaron Dieter Wolf for anyone interested. Yeah. His book, ancient Inc. And like, there's no mention of, of Vikings or, or Scandinavia or Norse in that whole book. Right. So, and that's the best survey so far on ancient, uh, Scandinavian tattooing, I suppose. So I guess what I'm super interested to learn about today and talk to Peter about is like where the, where the kind of historical imagination comes from about about uh, Viking tattooing. Because the other thing, and we'll, we'll, I'll set this up now because you and I talked about it, we had talked about it in a previous episode, you know, Celtic tattooing, as it was called, was this big kind of trend in the 70s and 80s and 90s, has taken on, as I'm sure we'll talk about t- uh, over the course of today, um, some quite problematic aspects. Some of the, a, a listener actually to the show emailed to kind of remind me that one of the, um, kind of really influential figures in developing "quote unquote" Celtic tattooing has come out and said things, you know, in recent years that are pretty, not even kind of coded racist, like just very out and out racist. Um, Nazis so, love the Vikings. I I would not I would not have guessed that at all. You know, weird yeah. internet fascists. You know, loving well, runes yeah. well, in, and sigils. In that case, it wasn't even. I don't think that that person uh, is an out and out. 
you know, white supremacists from Nazi or something, but they were very kind of invested in this idea. American woman, very invested in this, in this kind of pseudo Celtic history um, that she identified with to the point of, you know, buying um, Irish wolfhounds and things, you know, even her choice of dog was, was a kind of had an Irish in the name. And it, and it became this kind of like, well, these are my people, you know, the Celts, Celts are my people, the, the, the ancient, um, you know, the ancient Celtic people are my, are my people. So, I think that kind of pseudo history uh, is super interesting, um, and of course, I guess before we go over to Peter, the other thing worth saying is like absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it's very likely that some people in Scandinavia, historically speaking, were poking themselves with sharpened things <laughs> um, and leaving marks in their flesh. But as far as we can tell, at the moment, from all the kind of evidence that we have um, from archaeology which again, as we talked about in a previous episode, is fairly partial, but as best we can tell, yeah, the 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 Viking, the Norseman, the 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 um kind of ancient Scandinavian tattoo is something which is more cinematic and literary than it is a kind of product of historical research. So Peter, what what's your what's your take on the popular origin in the popular mindset of Vic- quote-unquote Viking tattooing. What we experience now is a definite Hollywood and TV show and computer game influence. It does have an older history in modern context, but, I mean, as Matt says, uh, we don't have an, any historical sources per se that can verify that the Vikings had tattoos. That might be because they they just didn't have the right uh, methods of burial. Um, I mean, it would have been wonderful uh, if, they, if they had chosen to bury people specifically in, in ice tombs in Upper Norway. That would have been great. Um, but we, do not, we don't have that kind of evidence. The only thing we have is a, a paragraph mentioned by Ahmad ibn Fadlan, who mentions that the Russia, the, the Rus Vikings that he met at the Volga, um, were decorated um, with dark green or dark blue or blackish ink from from fingernail to neck. But even that could have just been wall paint, almost temporary to do. It could have been dye painted onto the skin. And that is one literary source. And that is not anything that equates to evidence. So, um, so yeah, then we go on to the guesswork uh, about like the, the odds of them being tattooed because others that they encountered would have been tattooed or, well, I mean, I personally have many fun theories, but to jump back to the original question, it's Hollywood and computer games. I mean, the Vikings TV show uh, has made me a fair amount of money, um, (laughs) a lot of business, (laughs) as has uh, God of War and similar things. And um, luckily uh, they have, they, those things have also, upped people's imaginations about what Viking tattoos can be. Um, but to me, like my creative output is contemporary. I make shit up. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit controversial on the subject. There's a lot of Viking tattoo artists out there that tattoo with traditional hand poke, which is not traditional in a viking sense because... If the Vikings were tattooed, we don't know how they would have done it. It might have been scarification or hand poke or only uh, putting um, putting ashes into uh, open wounds to create a more permanent mark. We have no fucking idea. Um, and personally, I think that if the Vikings were around today, I mean, they were really good craftsmen to, and really good at using tools. They created magnificent uh, jewelry and stuff like that and carvings and stone and wood, if they were around today, they would use a tattoo machine <laughs> because it's here. Right, we've got the gear. That's such, a good, that's such a good way of putting it. I really love that. Like, I mean, one of the things that I say all the time, and it's such an obvious thing to say, although there's not a lot of space for it in a lot of um, you know, academic writing on tattooing, is that obviously right, tattooing reflects the visual cultures around it. So we find a tattooed on bodies, whether it's like, you know, people in the 1940s getting tattoos of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, or whether it's the Scythians who did you know, did kindly uh, bury themselves in ice tombs. Um, you know, we the, the the visual culture, the 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 tattoo designs that survive, 
reflect the kind of things that we find on rock carving, on metalwork, on ceramics, on textiles. Um, and so I think this kind of work that you're doing, Peter, this kind of thinking about, you know, because Vikings were the Viking cultures were very, very rich, obviously, artistically, um, and a lot of a lot of Viking imagery has survived. I was at the um uh, like historical museum in Oslo uh, last month, and I was sort of really seeing if I could spot any clues for any tattoo history. But what what really struck me there was that we have this amazing like visual culture history um, from you know from the uh, the, the, the millennia and, and centuries of Viking uh, exploration and Viking conquest and Viking culture, and so you know, and and we're, we're talking probably you know in a Europe in a kind of um uh like and you know uh, western timeline a kind of christian timeline we're talking kind of early modern period maybe slightly earlier right um that there's so much amazing uh, imagery there to draw upon and as you said like it's very possible that viking people had tattoos of some kind but if and it, even if they didn't what they did would be you know it wouldn't be something we can't imagine so the imaginary i think is a really really interesting and important part of of what you're doing like where do you get your where do you get your image sources from what what kind of images are you drawing upon oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> so i uh, god um i i have a lot of books um and one hell of a uh, an image library on my computer uh of historical artifacts and it is a, vo- a wide variety of, of imagery um, in the Viking Age, within the Viking Age, there is six slash seven, well, five slash seven styles of Nordic artwork, which by no means actually encompasses everything that there is of art, but there's like five to seven main styles. I'm not going to get into the details of all of them because it, it gets confusingly nerdy and <laughs> is very, very unnecessary. Um but those are the main styles that I work within, and most of my clientele understands it when I reference any of those styles because it's something you can Google. You can Google the Ringerika style, and then you can find imagery that um, has relevance. And each of these have some sort of uh, specifying form language that I then apply to the design That being said, I also sometimes do something that is a little bit more free fantasy, but based on a funny idea. Because what you mentioned about the choice of of art and design across all materials, um, there's a thing about what kinds of designs the Vikings put on what kinds of materials, actually. Because on cloth, for example... There's very specific types of embroidery and tablet weaves that were used for that that do not correlate with what was put on metal or put on wood or put on stone. Um, And then at the same time, as we go through time from around year 600 to around year 11, 1200, um, the designs change magnificently on, for example, stone and metal. Um, So the fun question is, if the Vikings did have tattoos, would it correlate to, for example, the kind of artwork they put on sword hilts and um, silver uh, jewelry? Or would it be something very unique? And I walk down this insane, dumb path of coming up with something that would be, to me, befit uh, a culture of Norsemen um, and have some foreign language from both archaeological findings, symbol language as well, Um, the whole petroglyph carvings of the Bronze Age of Scandinavia, as well as the runic uh, angular forms of the Futhark and Futhark alphabets. Um, And I came up with this whole whole thing. (laughs) We named it (laughs) Sirun, which is basically speaking runes or speaking magic. Um, And that was just like a fun little um, figment of my imagination. Um, that has then become a, a whole genre of what I tattoo, and other tattoo artists have picked it up and started doing similar, um, like a similar expression. Um, and my main reason to do that was because uh, of the idea that, well, the Vikings would have most likely done something that worshipped the body in a very specific way. 
I, um, but at the same time, I do believe that um, if they did have tattoos, they would have been done very, very well. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm very not fond of when people do like rough, grungy tattoos and they're like, oh, but the Vikings would have been like, it would have been a bit rough. It's like, have you seen the gold work they did, the filigree yeah, and right. carvings? They were insanely skilled at this. Why would they do grungy, rough edge tattoos? That makes no sense to me. Yeah. yeah. And even and even if you look at the the Scythian tattooing, for example, right from, I mean, uh, even earlier than than the period that you're talking about, which is preserved in the ice, that tattooing is very sinewy and very solid in the black work and very kind of, you know, de- in places very, at least very delicately and really well rendered. So and that you know that's that's several hundred, if not a thousand, years earlier than what we're talking about here. So yeah, I completely agree. I, that that kind of idea. I mean, I have this problem when I'm talking to people about tattooing in the Victorian period, let alone in the early modern period or earlier, right? Like somehow tattooers in the past couldn't tattoo well. Um, yeah, 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 I think that's such it, a good point. I mean, there's something plenty of tattoo that... artists now that can't tattoo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have a couple of those tattoos, but one thing that I, one thing I really wanted to ask you about, you mentioned that kind of like visual language and uh I've followed you on TikTok for quite a while, and one thing that I'm always really impressed with, with with your videos about your design process is how you tell the story, not only through where the tattoo was placed on the body part, but the flow of the overall tattoo. I think it was um, it was a, a video you did recently of the chaining of Fenrir, where you did it along that guy's arm. Could you talk to me about that process? Yeah. Um, I can try. I mean, you you reference TikTok, which is of all my social media outputs the most uh, nonsensical, uh, crazy one. Because, <laughs> oh God, um, <laughs> it's fun though. Um, yeah. So the way that I design my work on people is um, it's tricky, and I think I should have started this whole interview with a bit of a disclaimer. I'm. Um, <laughs> I'm an autistic person. My brain works in very weird ways. Um, and I Don't worry, really, both uh, me and Matt are on the spectrum, so you're, you're in yeah, safe hands. You have, you have good friends uh, in, in this space, my friend. I mean, honestly, is there any podcast that isn't um, run by <laughs> people on the spectrum? Um, so, but I'm glad. You know, good company. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really enjoy creative freedom. Right. But I also fear too much creative freedom because I often get emails from people who's like, I just love your work. It's the coolest thing ever. Do whatever you want on me. Have my arm. And I'm like, well, it'll be very black with more black and then some more black and a bit of solid black on top of that. And they go, oh, but that's not what I want. Like, well, then don't give me creative freedom because that's what my brain wants to create right now. Um, let's go back to my usual process, which is I ask clients, potential clients, about um, pieces they like, usually like five to ten images of reference and five to ten keywords. And then I shove that into my brain. And there it gets to um, mull about in the conscience, uh, subconscious of the cauldron that is my brain. And by the time the client then finally arrives at my studio, some six to eight months later, it has uh, fermented and become something. Um, And sometimes I do a little bit of pre-designing in the week leading up to the tattoo. I don't like doing it too far in advance because if I have too long between design and actual tattooing, I change my mind 11 times. Uh, And so does the client because clients tend, tend to take the design and show it to their friends and families and uncles and nieces, all of whom have some sort of insane input on where I have designed something wrong, uh, which is a terrible direction to go. Um, So I save it for like shortly before the sessions. And then it's fresh in my mind. And there's no other tattoo projects in my mind that can block my my output. Um, And then when the client shows up, we roll with it. Uh, I very rarely make it past the hellos. Here's a cup of coffee to, all right, take your shirt off, let's get you shaved, and let's get drawing and working. And then I start drawing furiously with a bunch of pens, and I freehand everything. Um, It's very rare that I would stencil anything on, unless it's like hardline geometry, which is another genre that I work in. And 
I really enjoy freehanding because you get to follow the dynamics and forms of the body. And to reference that to Vikings and the, the mad pioneers they were, if, if, the Viking, if a Viking craftsman had a pillar of wood to decorate, he would use it, he would decorate it accordingly. He wouldn't just slap something on as if it was a flat surface and then carve into it. He would form it around the pillar, spiraling and flowing. And I believe tattoos should, at least of this scope, should be done in the same way. So I work with dynamics and form. Uh, I have a background in doing special effects, building monsters and sculpting and stuff like that, which helps a lot. I've like playing around with clay for seven years of my life has um, given me a good 3D form language understanding. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I, I draw on them for a good half a day to a day. And then I finally have a, a moment to poke it on with a thin needle so the design stays on for the the next days. Um, and I have no idea why people dare to let me do this <laughs> because it's, it's insane and sometimes a little bit overwhelming to my head that people will travel from all over the world to my studio to let some madman draw on them with yellow, orange and red pens and hope for the best because it's fucking nuts. But they do that and I'm very flattered and honoured um, and I hope, I mean, to all of you out there who have been tattooed by me, who listen to this episode, thank you very, very much for your trust. I really appreciate it. That's the, I mean, that's the beauty of the, like, the insanity of that I love, um, particularly because you've got all these layers of like real serious scholarship and knowledge, if that's the right way to frame it. Certainly kind of, you know, you know this stuff inside out, as well as the creativity, as well as the kind of, it's interesting you, you say that you worked in special effects because I think that theatricality is also really evident in what you're doing. Um, can I ask you, like, were you a were you a kind of like Viking art nerd first and a tattooer second, or tattooer first and you thought, oh, I want to do some stuff that works in this vernacular, or is that a silly question? And both came at the same time. Like, what's your what's your journey into this stuff, both tattooing and the the kind of deep knowledge of, of, of Viking um, visual culture that you have? Uh, um, both is like purely accidental, really. <laughs> um, so I mentioned the special effects thing. I had a, a special effects company and um, a good team and everything was fine and dandy. And then in 2008, the recession hit, right? Um, and business dived immediately when you do something like special effects it's completely unnecessary on a societal level no one needs uh, elven ears or uh, <laughs> cinema exhibitions for windows and shit like that. it's just it's not needed so um so i i ended up being quite bankrupt and living on a farm in the middle of nowhere sweden um with my maniac friend henrik who kept me sane by uh, well sword fighting with me every day um <laughs> Because, because well, he felt that he had to keep. Because me of active. course he did. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to do a lot of uh, historical European martial arts, so lots of sword fighting, and it's probably a little bit where the Viking tattooing comes in. I'll get to that uh, after about a year of being a miserable bastard on a farm in Sweden. Um, I decided to do something with my life, uh, but I didn't know what, um, and I ended up talking to an old friend named Jesper. Um, who offered to help me out by teaching me how to tattoo because he used to be a tattoo artist. And I said, that is a terrible idea. Thank you for the offer. <laughs> um, but go about your business because nothing good will come of this. Because me thinking of tattooing back then was like, oh, bikers. Because um, that was like Danish tattooing is just like Hell's Angels and stuff like that. Um, Hell's Angels was, and the King. Yes, our good old king. <laughs> He had some cool tattoos and a cool attitude towards the world. I used to have um, to wheel him back to the Paris, the palace in a um, wheelbarrow because he got so drunk at the tattoo studio. <laughs> He's quite a legendary character. Just that there's an amazing <laughs> photo of him standing. He used to be a bodybuilder as well. And there's this posing yeah. photo of him standing. You must have seen yeah. it. He's just yeah. phenomenal. King, King um, Frederick the Tenth. There we go. Yeah. Of Denmark. Um, but no, but you're but you're you're right. Like the, the the particularly in in a way that wasn't quite as 
as limited in um, in uh, in England or in the United States even, but like Scandinavian tattooing was very just poor or nothing really. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I mean, we do have a cool tradition for sailor tattoos, um, but there was there was a, a massive period of where like tattoo shops were just owned by the bikers, and it was gritty. And my first tattoos were done in such a studio, and I had this um, like an overhanging mental block there. Uh, from the idea of becoming a tattoo artist. Even the other famous Danish royal, right? I'm just remembering Valdemar of Denmark, Princess Valdemar of Denmark, um, who actually was French, but married into the Danish royal family. So you think like she's got a nice royal tattoo. No, she's got a whacking great anchor on her arm. So even the Danish like royal family are getting like hardcore sailor tattoos. Yeah, I mean, we got our, our crown prince or the other prince, um, one of the heirs to the throne, he has a shark tattooed because anyone who's been in the Danish version of the, the Navy SEALs, the Danish SAS, right. um, they have to have a shark tattooed. Um, he, I think he has a hammerhead shark. So there are tattoos present <laughs> in the royal family, that's for sure. Uh, I, would, I would honestly be surprised if our good old queen does not have a Tolkien-related tattoo on her because she <laughs> she's a massive Tolkien nerd. She used to be pen pals with a man, as far as I know, and has illustrated uh, the book cover for at least one edition of The Hobbit, um, which is very, very cool. I'm not much one for royalty myself, but she is she's a proper art nerd. So <laughs> maybe she has a full back sorry, of... I- uh, Sauron or something. <laughs> I interrupted you. So yeah, so so growing up biker t- biker tattooing. Oh, yeah. Not not um, no no tattoos in your family or you weren't tattooed at that point? Uh I was tattooed, but that had put a fear of well, tattoos in me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um I think my my brother had a kanji thing on his shoulder. No, there was like small things here and there, but no one had heavy tattooing. I remember my great granddad having some sailor tattoos um, and also missing a couple of fingers because he'd lost them to the fishing nets and stuff like that. But he was like, he was an ogre of a man and he passed away when I was still small. I just remember him as this mountain of a human with terrifying hands due to the missing fingers that we had to shake because that was polite. And I don't know, everything about him was just terrifying as a child. But I do remember his tattoos. I remember that that is my first encounter with tattoos. But yeah, no real tattooing in my family. It seemed a bit of an, an alien thing. Um, but at the same time, I had designed tattoos for friends before. And there'd been like a brush with it online, helping people out with tattoo designs and stuff like that. So it wasn't completely alien. But the idea of becoming a tattoo artist, that was, that was a bit dangerous. Um, but after, well, I spoke to my friend Jesper and then said no. And then after like five, six days, I rang him up and was like, all right, let's do this. Cause I'm bankrupt <laughs> and life, life is bad. Um, so I went to him. Is this, all, learned, is this all sword fighting? Yeah. Well, I was still, I mean, it, sword fighting doesn't pay <laughs> the bills. I can tell you that much. Um, it's fun though, but hey, um, I mean, I'm staring at my old, training sword on the wall now um still around it'll never stop i hope um so yeah i went to him learned how to tattoo and then i started tattooing and i was bad at it as anyone knew what tattooing is and i kind of stuck to the whole dot work tattooing because it felt safe and that translated very well into tattooing some runes on people and then my friend Yorgo asked me if I could tattoo him like a Nordic style dog on his calf. And I'm like, I have no idea how to draw this, but I can find the references. And then I just, I started dabbling into it and then it just became a thing. Like it just took over. I stopped getting to do anything else than Nordic style tattoos and Celtic style tattoos and runes and so on. And I mean, my career just took off. Also, thanks to like the TV shows, uh, LA Inc. and all of that. That was big at the time. So all of a sudden, everyone wanted to get tattooed. Um, And when you're in Scandinavia, the whole cultural mindset of like, yeah, let me get something Viking. It was just there. So that grew. And it grew to an extent where I could see that, well, this is a market. This is a business. And I should focus on this. I should specialize and become good at it. 
So I started diving into it. I started buying every bloody book I could find and talking to every tattoo artist that had something um, in the Nordic style in their repertoire. And 12 years have gone by and uh, here we are. And it's been a very, very weird journey. (laughs) I don't think we've talked to a single tattoo artist who's had a normal journey into tattooing. (laughs) No, I cannot imagine. So had you done had you done art like formally? Had you done art degree or art at school, or you you just have that creative artistic kind of ability that you've been honing? I'm, I'm as uneducated as you can be. Um, schooling <laughs> schooling didn't sit well with me. Um, actually, the first time I moved to the UK when I was eighteen, it was with the intention of studying for a fine arts degree at the Nottingham uh, Trent University. Um, yeah. But that never happened. I ended up working for Games Workshop <laughs> instead and drinking a lot of beer. Oh yeah, I suppose, I suppose if you if you end you end up in Nottingham, working for Games Workshop is a good place for someone with your background to end up working. Yeah, fas- fascinating. I and mean, that makes now you've said that that makes so much sense as well, Peter. I mean, to be fair, I've I've joked with Matt that all of our Patreon money is going on one Evangelion uh, models and two uh, actually. Finding, finally getting me a Warhammer 40k mini set. So, you know, <laughs> if anyone is listening and wonder where your money goes, that's where it goes. It doesn't go back into the production of the podcast. It buys me Warhammer minis. I gave all my lead like 1990s dwarfs to a child and now they'd be worth thousands of pounds. So I gave Probably, them to yeah. a child. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I think we've all had toys in our childhood or hobbies in our childhood and youth that we've Don it away at some point and then lear- later learn that, oh, wait, that is worth a small fortune now. Damn it. I mean, I used to play Magic the Gathering before it became like a mentally expensive hobby where you could make thousands per card. And, you know, I look back at that and I just I try to block out that memory. Just think I, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to know how much I didn't make on that. It's best to just ignore that. Um but yeah, uh, England the first time around uh, to study actual actual study art didn't happen. And then I just, I moved back to Denmark and I started my special effects business with my old mentor um, and did that for seven years. Um, and that threw me into all sorts of creativity, uh, drawing, metal work, uh, sculpting, casting, carpentry, all sorts of mad stuff. Um and I, I, the, I think the only creative thing that I don't know how to do is welding. Besides from that, I've had my hands in, in everything else. Um, chainsaw sculpting, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and all of it has, I mean, it, it, it's been fueled by, uh, you know, that creative fire. Um, but I think I have a, a, a good gift of um, focus, the will to get up in the morning and actually uh, get something done. Which I mean, I've 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 owned very large tattoo studios both in Copenhagen and in Barcelona. Um, I've worked with having many tattoo artists work for me, and it is like being a cat herder. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like running this podcast, <laughs> but all the cats are on mescaline as well. They just, um, you know, tattoo artists are. Of all the artists I've worked with, they are the most insane by far. And it's lovely. I mean, the, the energy from it is fantastic. But if you expect your tattoo artists to show up on time, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had an appointment start on time ever in my life. <laughs> apart, apart from one guy, and that was the one on my calf that I got recently. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you really like Beneath the Skin and you want to help support us, you can do so on Patreon. For as little as five quid a month, you can help make this show possible, help us buy research materials. So if you like the show and you want to support us, consider kicking us a few quid a month and you'll get everything from bonus episodes to Q&As and you can even vote on what tattoo I'll get when we reach a certain subscriber count. Matt, have you got anything to say? You should really definitely uh, fund the Patreon because tattoo history is massive, right? Deep, wide, complicated. We're covering some big hit topics on the main feed, but on the Patreon subscriber-only feed, we'll be getting into some really more interesting niche, deep topics you don't want to miss out on. 
And honestly, the chance to kind of decide what Thomas gets on his body is probably just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Subscribe, chuck us a few quid. Don't miss out on the chance to ruin Thomas's body forever. Everyone knows that tattoo aftercare is one of the most important steps in getting a new tattoo. We all want our fresh new tattoos to heal as easily and hassle-free as possible so we can show them off to the world. That's why Sanoderm's here to help. Driven by science and innovation, Sanoderm products have been thoroughly tested and used by doctors and tattoo artists alike for over 10 years. Sanoderm brings cutting edge technology to make your tattoo healing process a breeze. No more messing around with cleaning and plastic every few hours with Sanoderm's amazing range of aftercare products. I personally have used Sanoderm to heal my tattoos in the past and they made what used to be a daily process of setting reminders on my phone to clean and rewrap my tattoo into a one-step process. Their medical grade products include aftercare balms, soaps, and my favorite, their second skin aftercare bandages. Sanoderm's tattoo bandages are designed to be waterproof, breathable, and keep your new tattoo protected from whatever the elements can throw at it so you can get on with your day worry-free and confident your new tattoo will look vibrant and will heal faster. Plus, their products are all natural and ethically sourced, so you can take comfort in knowing that you're healing your tattoos with nature's finest ingredients. So next time you're in an artist's chair, why not try Sanoderm, healing your tattoos the modern way so you can get on with your day. Check out the link in the description of this episode for discounts on a range of Sanoderm products or for more information. Can I, on the on the art side, and... um. I guess I, I, I want to get to other things as well, but on the art side, the other thing I love about your work, Peter, I'm wanting to ask you about is the colour, right? Because, you know, you talked about black on black on black, and I think that's such an amazing feature of what you're doing, and, and it's certainly a feature of all that imaginary Viking tattooing. But again, from what little I know and what kind of very naive ideas I have about the history of Viking art in general is that one imagines it to be quite monochromatic, right? Because the things that survive are wood, stone, metal. But there's seems to me that there's some interesting work on on the polychromy of Viking art, right? That the Viking art wasn't wasn't just monochrome. Um, and actually, I love that your work is is not afraid of, and your your practice is not afraid of like chucking some color in there where it works for design or works for the client. So. Can you talk a bit about that? Because I think it's such an again, it's such an unusual and interesting part of your work that, for all of its kind of pseudo historical basis, actually is probably again quite um, you know, probably closer to what Viking art would have looked like than what most people would imagine Viking art to be from there. You know, if they've looked at a few stone carvings. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a lovely subject. It also goes back to like if the Vikings had tattoos, um, because we can. We can see from color traces and archaeological findings that the Vikings really liked their bling, um, and we know <laughs> uh, we know from the trade that they did that they one of their favorite things to trade was, for example, silk from the Silk Road, um, and elaborate clothing would be made from this. So let's let's imagine that the Vikings did have tattoos and they had access to dyes that could tattoo their skin in red and yellows and blues and green, they would use it. I mean, skin cancer was not a thing, <laughs> something that they knew about at the time. They would have shoved it into their skin. There can be no bloody doubt about it. Um, and if you, there's lots of renditions of, for example, how the yelling stone would have looked when, um, when it was made. Uh, by the king of the time. Well, he didn't do it. When he hired someone to carve it, the lazy bastard, um, <laughs> it would have been beautifully painted in bl bright colors of yellow, blue, and red. Um, and it, I've, I've worked with this deep red color for a very long time um, that I enjoy using. It's very like a blood red, rusty color. People enjoy it. They feel that it's very much that Viking dark gloom feeling, just like, you know, a Hollywood Viking movie where everyone is clad in brown and the only color is blood, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a ridiculous rendition of what it would actually be like. Uh, it's very painful for someone like me with the knowledge that I have to watch the Vikings TV show where everyone is dressed in black leather armor, which probably didn't even exist um, with 
black and gray clothing only. Like they need they need powerful colors, more gold, more silver for it all to make sense. But anyways, never mind that. Um, then I started using this teal, dark teal color and getting to do some pieces in that. And then not too long ago, I convinced this um, Scottish client named Murray that it would be a bloody great idea if he let me to do an entire sleeve on him in like bold red, orange and yellow colors, like within a color palette, but bold. And he just didn't hesitate. He's like, yeah, let's do that. That's an insane idea. Let, let me get that on my skin. And I did that one to two. And then it, it just wouldn't stop. People like it. And so I, I now work with like two color palettes, this red burnished colors and a teal green colder tone set of colors. And sometimes I use both and bo all of that works. And I personally think that if the Vikings were tattooed and had access to the colors that's the direction things would have gone in very elaborate and very very colorful um because i mean we're talking about a culture that was willing to file their teeth and color the grooves in their teeth to look fancy for fuck's sakes uh, <laughs> it's madness as well i think it's something that is a big misconception about the vikings is that like they're an incredibly well-traveled culture as well so there's no there's nothing to say that they didn't interact with a culture that did have tattooing and got tattooed there, say. Well, certainly, you know, we talked to we talked to Maya with obviously tattooing of a very different kind, but tattooing in Sami and Inuit people, for example, um, you know, I'm sure would have been known to uh, certain parts of Viking culture. And yeah, as, as Peter said, heading across the Silk Road and... You know, we know we've talked about the Scythians, um, that that kind of northern and central European tattooing coming up through the Balkans. Like, it's it's, and also of course, like you know, the the Vikings reached whether they got back or not, who knows? But they certainly reached the eastern coast of the Americas, and they were tattooed um, people there as well. So yeah, hundred percent. The, the the I think what's so powerful about what you do, Peter, is that it's grounded in this beautiful and like a scholarly, I mean, it's, it's interesting you brought up Tolkien actually, because you know Tolkien's probably a good example of how how grounded fantasy can be in in history. And it's a you know, as a historian, I think it's the most Im important and beautiful thing to to be doing. And it's very serious as much as it's playful and and and, and creative. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that it is creative anachronism. Um, we're, we're playing we're playing with a fantasy that the Vikings were tattooed. We don't have proof, but. The whole like the travel thing. You spoke to Maya, who uh, it was an ep excellent episode, and Maya is a brilliant human being. It was really cool. Uh, but we know that the Vikings made it to Greenland, who they named it Greenland because they were assholes. Because yeah. um, they were liars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and they encountered um, the people there that uh, the Vikings called them Skrellinga, which is not a particularly nice word, really. Um, and then later. You know, the Danes came along and we colonized Greenland and we treated them not too well at all. And yeah, it all turned really dark. Um, but if the, if the tribes that the Vikings encountered there were tattooed, they would have picked it up. If the tribes that they encountered in Vinland in the Americas were tattooed, they would have picked it up. When they traveled to the Black Sea and to the Byzantium uh, realm, and if anyone had been tattooed, they would have picked it up. They got very far in their journeys, and the odds of them, ha some of them having made it all the way to India, for example, is there. There is um, a Buddha statue that has been found in a grave in Sweden. Um, so we know that there's a connect. Also, all the silk that has been found in Scandinavia, of course, came from very, very far away. And the odds of no culture at the same time having tattoos is quite small. So for guesswork, yeah, they probably at least one or 10 or 100 uh, Norsemen of the time had some tattoos. We just can't prove it. But it's, it's a fun little um, thing to play around with in, in, in the mind. And yeah, the so patchwork I... culture that, that predates the Vikings by far, their, their tattoos were elaborate and beautiful. But even on a primitive level, most cultures of the world had figured out that putting ashes 
into wounds to heal them cleaner. That worked really well. And when you do that, you get tattooed scarred. You get you get colored scars, which in itself is a type of tattooing. So, I mean, the odds of someone just coming up with it out of nowhere is is also there because it happened all over the world at different times. Yeah, I think yeah, you know, there was that. There was we again mentioned this before on the podcast, but there is this prevailing theory in the nineteen twenties when anthropology was really kind of you know having a particularly. I mean, it's a always having a particularly racist moment but the idea in the 20s was that tattooing um tattooing came from somewhere because it was so weird and so strange and so alien um and of course yeah you're completely right the the fact is that tattooing um is such an obvious and easy thing to do and there's so many ways to do it both deliberately and accidentally that you know the idea that at least some awesome guy wasn't one or lady wasn't walking around <laughs> with a tattoo um, is basically zero. I mean, I want to ask you then the sort of other side of that story, and maybe this is, um, and I know from talking to Thomas that this is something you're really interested in as well. The other part of this pseudo history is, of course, like the sort of darker side of it in a way, in terms of you know the the, the misappropriation of of um, Scandinavian and Viking myths and mythologies for uh, you know through the Third Reich, of course, but also into contemporary kind of culture, like. For all the kind of um, cosmopolitanism and all the kind of internationalism and all the beauty and the the, the subtlety of uh, Viking and Norse cultures, like they have, you know, there is there is a kind of side where people are people are getting getting these these kind of images tattooed on them because they're trying to reconnect to a, a false past that they imagine, you know, gives them some kind of authenticity as a as a white person. And I know. That you're really anti that and against that, and I wonder how. What well, well, you've noticed? What that, you think? You? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very happy. Very happy about it. I wonder how you feel about that, both as a as a tattoo artist, but also as you know, you obviously have to deal with customers potentially who are coming at you, misreading what you're doing or, or misreading what you want to do, and you've got to have those encounters. So, talk to us about the kind of false history of from the the white supremacist point of view. I also think I have to say that. Uh, Peter Peter Madsen, authentic white person, is uh, going to be the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Um, oh God! Uh, yeah, make sure you get my middle name or something like that into in into whatever title you use, because uh, not too long ago there was a terrible person in Denmark with the same name who decided to kill someone on a submarine and stuff like that. This this can all go down oh. a very oh very, yeah yeah. I watched that documentary. I forgot he was called Peter Madsen. No yeah, relation. I've had hate mail from people who think that I'm him. No. Uh, yeah, yeah. There was a. <laughs> I had to report a, Den- a lady in Denmark because she wouldn't stop harassing me, no matter where the bloody hell I blocked her. She just wouldn't stop. I ended up reporting her to the Danish police, and they went out and had a chat with her, explaining that this is not the man who is in prison <laughs> now. Because when you Google Peter <laughs> Matson, there's only a few people that comes up, and I'm definitely one of them. So yay. Um, <laughs> So get the oakman in there so that we're safe. Um, <laughs> then you also will not get hate mail for interviewing me. Uh, well, you might get that anyways uh, <laughs> for various reasons. Right. Nazis, Nordic culture, and other types of shithead um, is a fun subject. And we can, on more recent occasions, thank Donald Trump and that whole um, right-wing madman movement in the Americas. Um, for a lot of attention in that. God, I have so many stories to tell about this. It's <laughs> terrible. Um, right, so uh, Wagner and so on, and the whole Germanic golden age where people started thinking that the Vikings were something to be glorified. I often speak out against the glorification of the Vikings, first of all, because they were a bunch of raiding, pirating, rapist psychopaths who would colonize people's countries and displace the original inhabitants. They were not nice people. And then Golden Age comes around some hundred years later and much has been forgotten and much is brought back into a warped light. And it starts to be appropriated into this whole, like the the glorious barbarian, the strong Germanics and all of this uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to swear on this podcast. But oh, as much as you want. want. Oh, brilliant. I'll take the filter off then. Um, <laughs> um, so it, 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 
it gets stupid, as we all know. And the Nazis were very fond of iconography. I mean, they had a lot of weird things going for them, and one of them is definitely the sign. Um, they they really had that down. That and military strategy and all of that. They were wrong about so many other things, but some fancy flags were definitely going around. And that has all stuck around, from the Hagenkreuz to the SS to uh, the misuse of the uh, Othalos rune that we recently saw some idiots running around with when they stormed uh, the governmental buildings in America. Um, and, I mean, my, my opinion on it is that it's, it's atrocious to think that you can take um, an ancient culture and ancient art history and symbol language and appropriate it into something negative. Um, I've often ranted about the, the swastika uh, and um, part of this whole tattooist movement um, where we try to teach people that the swastika in itself is not a negative symbol. It's only the Hakenkreuz that was used in the 30s and early 40s in Germany that is a negative uh, version of the swastika. Besides from that, the swastika occurs in every culture all over the planet, probably because it, it happens in nature in spiral forms. It, we see it on the sky, the Big Dipper, uh, throughout the circle of the year, forms a swastika on the starry nights. Um, it's, it's everywhere and it's in every culture. And for some reason, these bastards decided to take it and use it as their banner, and now everyone thinks that it's negative. Except it's not everyone that thinks that it's negative. It's only the Western world. Because if you bother to travel a bit, go to India, China, Japan, and so on, it's still a positive symbol for spiritualism, for luck, for the sun, and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so it's actually a minority on the planet that sees it as a negative, because there's more people who still use it in cultural <laughs> context as a positive symbol. I know there's going to be a lot of flack for this. I know it's a controversial subject. Um, just to everyone out there listening, I have swastikas tattooed on my body. A lot of them. They're all from different cultures, including a Scandinavian one. I have a good old-fashioned Scandinavian fulfort tattooed on my left arm uh, that I stabbed on my own arm by hand poking. I'm very fond of it, and it is a hill that I'm willing to die on. It is not a negative symbol. If you see a swastika that has equal lengths, arms, legs, or whatever you want to call them, on a white circle, on a red flag, that's the bad one. That's If someone's waving that flag around, go punch him. Um, <laughs> yeah, context. I mean, we talked about that in the previous episode, actually, when we were, and I talked a bit about Man Woman in particular, who yeah. you know, was the oh, real man. pioneer of that, of, that, uh, of that way of working. Yeah, 100%. And I... You know that uh, that um, that approach, I think, and that you know, I think we we could talk about it, and we did in that other episode in a lot of detail about it. But I think it's a really important point to raise. So, I mean, do you do you have people coming to you, or have you had Peter who are like, you know, I wanna, I wanna, I don't know, black sun, or I wanna get some you know, some Vols Engels, or you know, that kind of thing, and and you have to kind of figure out what, like, you have to kind of get a vibe from them, right? And figure out what it is that they're... Yeah, that's a tricky thing. It's one of the reasons I speak out so much. Um, one, I believe that it's important when you have... <laughs> Don't... <laughs> when you have a big um, audience, uh, it's important to speak out. Use your, uh, your, your touch base surface with humanity to actually make a difference. So I speak out against this because I believe it's the right thing to do. I mean, I spent the early part of my teens in anti-Nazi demos... Um, and took some serious punches for it, and I'm still happy that I did. Um, and, I mean, I'd still be willing to join an anti-Nazi demo to this day, gladly. But now I have this big audience, and I can speak to everyone, so I do that. But I also speak out, because I want to make sure that, you know, neo-Nazis don't send me an email trying to get booked. So I get this... Yeah, that's a real, that's a real, that's a real waste of your day, isn't it? Or if... <laughs> Oh, the Nazis are emailing me again. Got to answer the Nazis' emails. But when that happens, it's just fueling my fire because it's fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my brain just gets happy because it means that there's someone I can, one, insult, and two, disappoint when I tell them no. <laughs> and that is lovely. Um, <laughs> they're, cute when so, they, they're cute when they cry, though. 
Uh, yeah, and they do. Oh my God, the whining is amazing. Because, you know, within a month, we maybe get two or three emails where I go, wait a minute, let me just look up their Facebook profile or their Instagram profile and have a closer look. Uh, there's a lot of education I have to do. You mentioned the, the black sun symbol, the Sonnenrad. And a lot of people think, for example, that the Sonnenrad is, it's just a runic Nordic symbol. It's a historical symbol, but it is not. It was in fact invented by Himmler. Um, and it, it does not have an ancient meaning. There are symbols that are similar to it from ancient Greece and such, but as, as a symbol in itself, it is bad. Um, and it is one of those no go. So when people send me that and go, I would like this tattooed on my knee or whatever, I start, you know, looking a bit deeper. Um, and I, we try to teach people on, we've got some pages on Facebook and stuff like that. When people post, oh, I would like to have this tattooed, we try to tell them that, look, that's a really bad plan because it is, in fact, a Nazi symbol. <laughs> Um, are you a Nazi? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, funny, it, unless you are a Nazi, that's a bad plan. Yeah. Um, but we, I mean, I'll give you two stories because there's both good and bad. I had a Swedish guy send me an email um, about wanting to get a sleeve from me. And it was extensive. And there was quite a few symbols in there where I was like, mm, this doesn't sound right. He was, there was very particular mentions of, of the Sonnenrad and like an eagle and some other iconography i don't remember the details and i wrote him back and i was like are you have you followed me on social media for a while have you checked my output are you aware that i am in most people's eyes probably quite left wing very anti nazi um i'm all for open rights for everyone pro gay pro uh open genders and all of these things um, are you aware of this? Because I get the impression that you might be a bit of an opposition to me. <laughs> and he he wrote back and was like, you're right. I'm actually quite right wing. I, I'm a member of this political movement uh, called something nasty. Um, and all of this stuff. And he wrote a long email writing me uh, in detail about why he believed I should still to do him. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. He didn't back down. He thought... Basically, his argument was, I think we can put aside our political differences <laughs> because I really like your artwork and I think it should be on me. And I don't think that tattoos should be political. I don't think art is political. And this is where my brain starts to melt down a little bit because <laughs> when, people, when people argue that artwork isn't political, they are idiots because art has been used as political commentatorship for several thousand years. So that, that was particularly infuriating. And I had to write him back in very stern words um, and decline his idea. But it didn't end there. Two or three months later, he wrote me back and was like, I've thought about this a lot. And I really think you should try and reconsider because I really like your tattoos and I want you to do a sleeve on me and I'll pay you really well. And I had to explain to him in great detail. It wasn't just, I didn't, second email, I didn't just decline him. I explained the intricate workings of my tattoo studio, which involves, a, there's a lot of people in my studio that works around me, my assistants, my team, and we're all in great opposition to him. I mean, um, <laughs> there was a lot of reasons that that guy would have his, uh, his ass thrown out of our window, basically. I mean, uh, out of the team in my studio... There's a fair bit of gay, quite a lot of um, uh, fluidity, a uh, hell of a lot of H ADHD and autism and stuff like that. And we all believe in human rights. We don't believe in oppressing any people on the planet. Um, so he just, he didn't really fit in as a client. And that was, it was one of those negative experiences with all of this. And then sometimes there's a positive. Last week, I was tattooing a mother and daughter, um, a, w a wonderful woman named Pam, who I would guess is somewhere in her 50s, and her daughter, um, who is part American native. Uh, and um, when the daughter had, uh, had gone to her mother with my name and gone like, look at this guy's work, let's get tattooed by him, mum. <laughs> Pam had said something along the lines of, is he a racist? <laughs> like, is this guy a Nazi? 
because apparently that's a thing in America. Anyone that does Nordic tattoos has a tendency to be a little bit on the racist side. But so her initial uh, reaction had just been to like check if he is a dirtbag, um, and the daughter had gone out, done her research, and gone back and said he is not. And in the meantime, Pam had looked me up on TikTok and found a video where I was apparently ranting about Nazis being terrible people. Um, and had she had in the meantime decided that she wanted to get tattooed by me. And the first thing that Pam told me when she had walked in my door and had offered a cup of tea was, I'm so glad you're not a Nazi. Um, and told me the story about this. <laughs> All right, faced with a very nice American woman who just cheerfully told me that I'm, I'm so glad you're not a Nazi. All right. That, that warms my heart. That makes me really happy. <laughs> and you're, you're really doing um, your own service on education as well, because you have a book that explains, you know, runes and their mean, you know, binding runes, sigil runes that I saw uh, that you uploaded maybe like four hours ago that I saw just before this video. And you're really helping people understand that there is more meaning to these, you know, symbols than just, oh, Nazis have them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We just launched that book like four or five days ago. Uh, in the book is a chapter or like a, a page uh, named Fear Not the Fulfold. So do not be afraid of the swastika. Uh, speaking of symbol appropriation. But yeah, it is an education on on the history of runes and fu the Futhark, uh, the other Futhark in particular and the bind runes and sigils and all the misconceptions that there is. And I write a lot about um, but now it's it's really uh, it's almost a personal thing how you can use it, but it's definitely not something to misuse. Um, so it's been a, f a fun journey to write that book. And what what are some of the misconceptions that people have about runes? Oh, well, we've already not to give away on... everything for free from your book. You know, <laughs> still buy the book. Um, so one of the principles I run with is share as much information as you can for free. I give away to two designs online on our social media and on my websites and stuff like that because. I think that if I give things away for free, it'll up the standards of tattooing. And I don't think that it, it hurts me to give this out. Um, I've, I've learned from this, uh, especially this Norwegian artist called uh, Kim Holm, who's amazing, an, an ink artist, and he gives away all of his artwork for free. And oh yeah, he, do, he does the, the ink monsters on TikTok. Exactly, like, he's, fan, yeah. he's fantastic, he's brilliant. He is, and he's so out there. Like, I love his stuff. And his mentality is great. And when I when I saw that, I've always been a fan of sharing. But when I saw that, it just it spurred me on to just start giving. Um, so thank you, Kim, for 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 making that happen. Um, but oh, I forgot where my brain is. No, yeah, don't don't mind sharing the secrets. Um, I did lose track of where we started here. Um, the misconceptions about the runes. Well, the first one we t we already touched on are runes associated with Nazis and all. So yeah, it's it's associated to some extent with na Nazi iconography in parts of Germany. Much most of Germany, you can't really have runes visible because they are so associated with their negative past. I think it's a little bit too um, afraid of touching the warm uh, stove mentality. Sadly. Uh, because that means you can never talk about it properly in in plenum, and that I think that's a bad. Yeah, um, and that that also mindset. gives people cover, right? Because I know that there have been some ta some tattooers who, you know, it, it, people have uncovered that they've got a big history of doing runes and racist caricatures and all kinds of other things, and they say, "Oh, it's just a." I don't. I don't mean that. I don't. It's just a coincidence that this is the rune that was used as the um, you know logo for the company that made Zyklon B. Right, they kind of, they kind of go Christ. under the. Oh, look, this is I didn't know what it was, right? But of course, as you said, if you don't talk about it and you don't talk about it, it gives people weirdly this weird plausible deniability when they actually yeah. are caught out, right? Yeah, definitely. I I do believe that sharing information about these things as much as possible, having it out there in the light, is is really important. The reason with the whole swastika movement to have to try to reclaim the swastika is to take power away from neo Nazis. Because if you can remove the power of a symbol, you remove the power of the people behind it. So information sharing is really, really important. But anyways, to, to move on to other misconceptions, uh, we see Veg Visiers tattooed all the time, yeah. for example. I wanted and, to ask you about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very common question. Um, and and other um, of the Icelandic Galdrastafir uh, 
the signs that and they're from books from the 15th 16th 17th century typically actually written by clergymen of the Icelandic church that were beholden to the to the pope um and to the catholic church and it's all like very esoteric magic that uh, it relates to uh, the solomonic sigils uh, that were used to uh, according to the stories used by solomon to build the temple in Jerusalem, uh, use by binding demons and all these things, it's all very, very much down down that route, and it's not it's not particularly Vikingy. It is Nordic because it is Iceland, <laughs> um, and and it is super fascinating. But believing that because you have a Vikvisir that you thereby have a Viking tattoo, is a little bit of a stretch because again we don't know if the Vikings even had tattoos, so it's a fun subject. It's like a thousand, it's a thousand years out of time, almost, right? Or like eight, nine hundred years out, like too, too recent. Yeah, I mean, anywhere between five hundred and nine hundred years off. Um, yeah. <laughs> that being said, I mean, the runic uh, systems were used very late in time. Uh, in Sweden, for example, there's an area that had, I think, it's up to like nineteen twenties that they had runic script in school. That was what you wrote with. Um, and uh, it's these kind of things that often glide past people's consciousness because it's not, not out there. Um, and I think there was a, a... There was a famous, like, sorry, there was a, there was a famous flash sheet, or probably more than one, but in the, like, 70s uh, and 80s where it was, like, this rune equals this letter in, like, the Latin English alphabet. So people would come in and say, I want my name in runes right and you just use it like a font do you yeah. do you get some of that still kind of yeah and i believe that people should just do it uh which yeah, is a bit, right uh, it's a bit controversial uh, but i do uh, there's a lot of puritans out there who will be like oh but if you want a sentence from your english language if you want that tattooed in runes then you first have to translate it back into norrin and then have it translated into the contemporary younger futhark to fit um, and then it must be chiseled into your skin with a blunt instrument kind of thing. It, it gets a bit much. Um, <laughs> I think people during should a, just... During a full moon. It. Yes, probably a full moon, uh, an eclipse, and sacrifice a chicken to the gods and all these things. Um, I think people should just go ahead and get tattoos because they want tattoos, because it's great to have cool tattoos. And if they want their daughter's name tattooed in runes, they should do it, and they should choose what whichever runic uh, font script that they prefer, because it's a personal choice. Your tattoos are for you, and if someone wants to go all historical uh, samurai, um, you know that whole manic keyboard uh, anger, I want to be right because you're clearly historically wrong. Then let them sit in their home cave and go absolutely nuts about it. That's their problem. It's a them problem. You should be happy about your tattoos. Um, what you should do is try to make sure that it's translated just slightly correctly so that the letters are not off. But besides from that, go for it. Yeah, Thomas and I talked a bit on the uh, when we talk about Ink Master about um, like uh, Army James of all people basically sort of saying, well, that tattoo is not correct because the Japanese wouldn't have used that color. Or And it's like, well, A, you're wrong about the history anyway, mate, but. <laughs> Secondly, it doesn't matter because we live in the 21st century. So yeah, I think this is this kind of postmodern, if that's the right word for it, kind of engagement with with the the, the historical sources and the history and and finding. I mean, there's a lovely. I think the is it the bio line on your Instagram that I noticed, um, which is uh, contemporary historical with an attention to detail. Like I think that sums up exactly what you're doing, right? Like it's such a beautiful and. Um, you know, intelligent and sensitive and, and funny and enjoyable and joyous way of engaging with, with the historical sources here and, 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 and trying to deal with this in a way that isn't preachy and isn't um, didactic, but at the same time can like teach people stuff. I think that's amazing. Like it's very, very humbling. I see it very much as a playground. I know that I have many colleagues out there that, um, that handle it very differently and I have great respect for them. They have their own approach to their own art. And that is for them to do. That is their path that they have chosen to walk. I know a lot of people that only do hand poke tattoos, for example, because they feel that it gives them a more sacred connection to the client and to the earth and to the designs that they, they work with. And I love that. 
that is really amazing because that's their artistic path. But preaching it, that's a different thing. And personally, like I have chosen my methods based on efficiency. I, I put sleeves on people in, in a week, so I use a machine. And I work with my colleague, Matt, who's he is a machine. And within a week, we managed to pack a lot of ink on our clients from abroad because we need to do that. And we couldn't do that with hand poking. And sure, there's a charm to it, but that's just not my path. But whichever path these tattoo artists choose, their clients will choose them accordingly and because of it. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's a wonderful way of working with art because that's what art is meant to be, very individual. Yeah, and I think I don't, I mean, um, we don't need to talk about him in any detail, but I've, I've, lo- I've known Colin Dale for a long time. And I think like his approach is interesting in this for the same reasons because you know he's a canadian guy who moved to denmark with a scandinavian father and um he's he's done lots of amazing research on you know he worked with aaron as well on trying to figure out ancient tattoo techniques and he has a much more i think he has a much more kind of um what's the right way of putting this like i think he he he, he probably thinks about him the work, the work he does in a lot more you know, a lot more narrowly authentic way in inverted commas than you do, I think. But his, but his work, you know, even where he's kind of creating bone ne- needles and things, it still has a playfulness to it. And I think, you know, um, I think you and him, you're probably working in a similar way in lots of ways. I'm sure you, you disagree with each other in lots of things as well. But I think there's an interesting connection because of the limits of the history, right? Like you, you're working here in a particular kind of space and how you interpret and work with it and, and turn it into a tattoo that's going to work for you and your client um, is super interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, to touch on, on, on Colin and his work, his style is amazing. And while, like for example, his, if, the, if for historical rec- uh, recreation, what he does, his hand poking methods and all that, is probably in line with what would have been done in the age of the Vikings. Um, his own artistic impression is his very personal style. Like it falls within the whole genre of uh, knot work and binding and all of this. But his dragon heads, for example, when I see his tattoos, I immediately know that's a Colin Dale tattoo. I don't look at it and think that's a Nordic tattoo inspired by this piece here. Uh, or this artifact here, I see it and I know it's Colin's work. And that's one of the reasons I find it to be phenomenal because he's managed to express his own style so well within a genre. Like He's really carved out his own space. And I love that. And for, for how, however much I preach that hand poking tends to be a little bit inefficient, Colin is terrify- <laughs> terrifyingly fast at hand poking. I've I know, seen right? him I've seen, hand yeah. poke, and it's insane. Very, very impressive. Um, so, I mean, I can't really put a finger on that. But yeah, I mean, sure, we we probably have a, a million disagreements because artists and two artists were all were full of opinions. Um, you know, it's a very manly thing to have opinions on things. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I have I have opinions professionally. It's my job to have opinions. So I'm a professional podcaster. Cool. I I do as well. But uh, it, it's funny because <laughs> it, it does kind of bring it full circle in that you know similar to probably how two Viking woodcarvers or artisans a thousand years ago would disagree about how they chisel out a you know block of wood. You're kind of you're bringing it back full circle. You know Viking quote unquote Viking Nordic tattoos. You're gonna argue to the nth degree about uh, who's right and who's doing it right and who's better and oh, yes. who's worse. But uh, yeah, as we, definitely. as we're coming to a close, I, I feel like honestly, Peter, I think we could talk to you all night and just never run out of stuff to talk about. Um, I just want you to tell where can everyone find you? Where can, where can they pay you to get tattooed? Where can they follow you online? Where can, where can they buy your books <laughs> buy um, your merch? Right. Well, I'm I'm everywhere as uh, nor- northernblack.com uh, and northernblack.oak on uh, Instagram, northernblack something on TikTok. Northernblack in general is my my brand name. Northernblack.shop is my web shop that's full of cool weird merch that I make and my books, most importantly, books about Nordic artwork and runes and so on and so forth. Um, and my more serious stuff would be on YouTube on northern black there where i talk a little bit more in depth about all of these things 
Um, but yeah, we're we're everywhere. We even have a Twitter. We don't use it, so don't go there. But we do have it <laughs> because that was, someone insisted that we have a Twitter. I don't know. Just uh, just uh, domain squatting your own name. And uh, if you enjoyed this show, I want to say thanks very much, Peter, for talking to us. It's been an yeah, absolute you know, fascinating conversation. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more, you can find us online at Benitskin Pod. You can subscribe to our Patreon for as little as five quid a month. You can get episodes like this early and you can get all our bonus episodes. I think almost every episode we referenced in this episode is uh, behind the paywall, but uh, little as five quid a month, you can get all those great, great episodes. If you subscribe at the £15 tier for at least one month, you can get a signed copy of Matt's book that he sends and signs into each envelope with a small kiss and puts it in the post box to be sent directly to you. We don't declare that to customs because I feel like they might tax it or it might be a biohazard. Who knows? You can follow me <laughs> online at God of that guy needs. That's G-U-Y-N-E-Y-S. And you can find Matt at Matt Lauder. Peter's looking at me and wondering how many times has he done this uh, ramble. I'm very good at it and can do it with only one breath. I'm not on TikTok. No one needs to see that. <laughs> we will be on TikTok. I'm going to set up an account tomorrow so Peter can share our stuff. And you have Matt, to, you could... so I can share you and give you guys some support. And thank you for having me. Oh, bless you. Very appreciate it. It's been a joy. <laughs>